Well, good morning. It is good to be back at Green Pine Baptist Church. I have uh, missed seeing you guys. I think January was the last time I was here. I keep up with you guys pretty closely. Um, I speak with Dick quite often. He tells me what's going on, and I'm extremely encouraged about what I hear. And um, I have noticed that you guys have made some technological advances here lately. I'm watching these messages on uh, Facebook. That's great. Fantastic. Compliment you on that. It's been easier to keep up that way. I said this the last time I came. I'm going to say it again because it really is true. The word that comes to mind when I think about standing here behind this pulpit on October 11th, 2020 is uh, unworthy. Um, I told you last time I was here, probably really not my wheelhouse. Um, but I always look forward to this because it's one of those things that God gives you an assignment and it's a little more than you can handle. And he always comes through. He always delivers. He always gives you what you need to get the job done. But... Um, I always get more out of this than you do. And one thing I wanted you to know today is that this message that God gave me is really meant for me more than it is for you. But I think, I think you, will, you will hear from the Lord today. I really do. Um, so much identified with what Jackie had to say a minute ago uh, when he was reading from 1 Corinthians. Amazing what we've been through this year. It's really overwhelming to recount what has happened with the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the lives that have been taken, the fear that has been created at unprecedented levels, the shelter in place, the social distancing, the face mask. It's all part of the new normal, isn't it? The economic engine of the country was shut off, just turned off for a while, and the fallout from that has been life-changing for many people. Lost jobs, lost businesses, lost retirement funds, the loss of hope for many. And I'm afraid we haven't seen the end of the ramifications of that. There's probably more to come. In the middle of all that, if that weren't enough, social justice issues surfaced again, and we were all reminded of our, the brokenness of our relationships and the sinfulness, the underlying sin sinfulness that is in our hearts. There's this unresolved bitterness from the past sin of slavery and race issues that keep sticking up violent protest against police brutality on the streets of large American cities and something we've never seen before is government officials and law enforcement standing down while all that activity takes place, burning, looting, destroying property. Something never seen in our country. And how about the for a little more pressure, how about the forest fires in the West? Five million acres destroyed and burned by fire, with 27 dead and thousands losing homes. Hurricanes this year, unlike we've ever seen. In 2020, the total number of named hurricanes is 23. Nine of those hit the U.S. mainland. Incredible. And still there's more, the impeachment of our president. We were put through, we endured the trial of his impeachment, the highest leader, the highest office in the land. And I looked not just at what's going on around me in the culture and in the nation, but I looked inside my own job, my own career, and I, I would say, stand before you today and say 2020 has been the most stressful the most difficult, the most turbulent of my professional career. Injured employees, new leadership, 
lost employees, employees who won't come back to work because it's better for them not to. Incredible issues that we're dealing with that I've never seen in my 35 years of professional experience. My wife and I are dealing with the special challenges of aging parents and how to help them and how to serve them as best we can. We could all go on. You've got your list. I've got mine. But we faced all this with very little interaction with believers. We, the church stopped meeting for a while, and rightfully so. I was telling uh, Jackie this morning that even in my home church, uh, we found out yesterday that my pastor has tested positive for COVID-19. It has affected everyone, everywhere. And lastly, this is the last thing I'll bring up because I don't want to be too depressing here today. Just, just painting a picture of 2020, though. Probably the most significant and contested presidential election year in the history of our country. I've, no other time in my lifetime have two candidates and two parties been so divided and the stakes of the election so high in regards to the future of this country. Accusations, investigations, probes, barbs, personal attacks, they fill the news each night, igniting the most active political storm in my lifetime. So very stressful. What a year. Discouraging, depressing. We listen to the news where we would hope to be encouraged and hear the truth. And we hear our leaders' strategies for turning the world back to normal. Um, I've never seen this type of stress on the country or on the nation. And I really have been reminded of something in all this. As I listen to the newscasts, as I listen to the political leaders, as I read editorials, as I watch the news, and even as I talk with other people, here's what I have been reminded of. Man has very little regard for or interest in the truth. The atmosphere in our culture right now seems to reek of spin and deceit and disregard for the truth. And I was thinking about that. I remember when this was 29 years ago. Some of you will remember this. Um, it's actually 29 years ago to this very day that then Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas was being uh, nominated for the Supreme Court. And uh, a young lady named Anita Hill leveled harassment charges against him and testified under oath about the wrongs she had endured at the hands of this man. And she provided great detail in her testimony, effectively destroying his character. <clears throat> and Judge Thomas, as you might guess, responded in kind. He denied every single allegation. The case was a public circus, the first of many, I might add. We see, we've seen that many times since then. But it did crystallize for me a simple reality in watching that case. There is a truth. Even when we don't know it, and we can't see it. The, two, the testimonies of two people, Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill, were diametrically opposed. It was impossible that both of them were telling the truth. Their stories were counter. But there is a reality It's, there is a truth of that whole matter. It exists and it's real. And it's not dependent on what Anita Hill says or what Clarence Thomas says or thinks or remembers. 
The truth is the reality of the events and the words and the acts that actually transpired. There is a truth. And it seems that today that the art of spin and deception, not the art of telling the truth, is the most valued in our culture. I heard Jackie mention the debates, the daily news, the writing that we see, it's very difficult to find the truth, and they're the places where we should be most likely finding the truth. The current issues of social justice for all and COVID-19 are so polluted with the noise of half-truths and untruths that people are moved and manipulated to what I call insanity. The loss of touch with reality. And they're taking actions that don't even make sense. They're not reasonable. That's kind of a bleak picture, but it does sum up what I've been reminded of in 2020. And as a Christian, this is extremely frustrating. The author of the Christian faith himself, Jesus Christ, had much to say about the truth. And the, that's our goal today. That's the goal for our for, for our time today is to remind us, mainly me, of what Jesus and other inspired writers of the Holy Scripture had to say about the truth and to be encouraged by that here on October the 11th, 2020. Before I begin, i got to give one credit here. Um, I want to give credit to, the, to focus on the family and a body of work known as the Truth Project where it was the source of a lot of what I'm going to say today, has, has helped me extensively. I would recommend that to you. I would recommend that to anyone. It has uh, been a blessing, especially in times like these. Before we get into that, before we get into the scripture, let me ask God to bless our time really quickly. Father, again, we turn to you. We ask you to speak. We hang on every word that comes from your mouth. We acknowledge our sin as we've already done. We ask you for your spirit and presence, and we know that you have so promised. We claim that promise this morning. We pray that you would bind up the evil one in this place and advance your kingdom and your agenda. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I'm going to do something strange to introduce this message before we get into scripture. I'm going to ask you a question and let you soak on it for just a second. <clears throat> it's an important question. And you're going to think it's a simple one. And it really is, but it kind of surprised me um, when, when I dug in and found out what the answer was. So let me ask you the question. Why was Jesus born? And why did he come into the world? Why was Jesus born? And why did he come into the world? While you're thinking about that, I want to give you a little hint here. Jesus specifically and clearly answers that question in Scripture with those very words. He did that in a conversation that he had with none other than Pontius Pilate after his arrest. So what we're interested in seeing today is what did Jesus say was the reason for his birth? and the reason that he came into the world. In my world, it, this is a little known scripture. In yours, it may not be. But I remember thinking when I first asked myself that question, a couple of things came to mind. Why did Jesus, why was Jesus born? Why did he come into the world? To call the sinner to repentance. 
to seek and save that which was lost. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Or as John 5.24 says, to grant us eternal life. And even those, those even though those answers are biblical and they are the results, they are facts about Jesus' life that are true, to me it's significant, maybe even crucial, to recognize that when Jesus' physical life was on the line and he was being questioned before Pilate, the words he used to describe his life purpose were not those. His words were much more high-level big picture. So before we go to this passage, it's in John 18. Let me tell you about the setting. Uh, you probably already know this, but we need to review it because it makes a difference. Uh, Jesus has been delivered to Pilate by religious leaders who are falsely accusing him of wrongdoing. It's fake news. That's nothing new, right? So, Pilate is questioning Jesus about his position and what his crime was. So there's tension. There's political pressure. There's a defendant who had not done anything wrong, who up until this time had been silent and made no defense for himself. And then we go to John 18. Let's look in, uh, let me read uh, verses 33 through 38. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate? replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king, in fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is, is what? To testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. So there, in Jesus' own words, we get the answer to the question. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So, the reason Jesus was born was to testify to the truth. And let me ask you this, if that was the reason he was born and came into the world, we have to conclude, I think you would agree with me, that truth is important. That's why Jesus came into the world, by his own confession. So truth is important. And as a matter of fact, we see him, Jesus, and other inspired men Speaking about truth all over Scripture, I want us to look at a few of those, okay? John 14, 6 and 7, that's how this message today started with John 14, 6 and 7. I thought that was going to be my main text, but it is part of the, it's part of the story, but it's not the main text. I apologize for that. I gave Dick the wrong, uh, the wrong main text. But John 14, 6 and 7, some of you guys probably have it memorized, where Jesus says, I am the way the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him 
and have seen him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That was spoken by the one who said, the reason I was born and came into the world was to testify to the truth. Now, John 1, 17, and I'll go kind of fast here. If you can st stay with me, that'd be great. I can send these scriptures to Dick if you need me to. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John 17, 17, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. John 4, 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth, just like Jackie prayed. John 8, 32, Jesus speaking to the Jews who had believed in him. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. John 14, 16 and 17. These two are some of the most powerful and meaningful, I think. John 14, 16, and 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and in you. the third person of the Trinity that makes resonance in our hearts is called the spirit of truth. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now how about that promise when it comes to truth? We could, we could talk the rest of Sunday afternoon about the Holy Spirit. We did that one time when I was here, I think. We could talk a long time about the Holy Spirit, but one of the functions of the Holy Spirit that resides inside of us, it guides us into all truth. We have this internal compass that points to true north. We, we have the ability to discern truth. Very powerful. I could have listed many more verses, but those... Those are, are a good start for how the Jesus and other writers in the Holy Scripture speak about the truth. And so we recognize that this must be important. It has to be important. Then I want to just point out that Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. That comes from the passage that we looked at where he was talking with Pilate. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Well, think about that for a second. What are the implications of that statement? What does that imply? Well, one thing that stands out to me is <clears throat> it implies that there are sides. Everyone who listens to me is on the side of truth. There must be sides. I didn't say that. Jesus said that, right? There are some who seek and find the truth, and there are some who do not. There's a dividing line that separates people. It's normal. It's not abnormal. That doesn't go too well in our culture, does it? This culture is not comfortable with that. It goes against the grain. The culture stance is tolerance and inclusiveness. 
Don't be so rigid about this matter of truth. Who gave you Christians a monopoly on the truth? How arrogant, how exclusive. And actually, Jesus himself drew the line. God himself drew the line. That's why I'm obligated to confess that the line is there. And so are you. And we've seen it. We've already alluded to it this morning. Brother and sister, are you punished? And are you shamed if you disagree with the world's stance about that line? Woo! A biblical understanding of truth is not tolerated in, the, in our culture and in this world. Well, let's talk really quickly about an implication there. How do we respond to those who are not on the side of the truth? The word of God is clear. We should respond with kindness, gentleness, not with resentment. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26 says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. We are to look at those on the other side of the line as captives. We are to sympathize. We are to be gentle. We are not to assume that the fact that we understand and see the truth had much to do with our own righteousness. It was God's grace that allowed us to see it. So those on the other side of the truth are captives. They've been deceived. And now it gets a little more exciting to me because when Jesus says everyone on the side of truth listens to me, that implies that there is a truth. Just like we said earlier, there is a truth. What is that truth that Jesus came to testify about? That's an important question. And there are so many places in Scripture we could go, but I think this one in 1 Timothy is one of the best. It sums up the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality that exists in our human experience. And it exists not because we believe it, but because it is reality. It is factual. It would be true even if we didn't believe it. It is the ultimate reality. 2 Timothy 2, verses 5, excuse me. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 through 7. I urge then, well, I'm going to skip the first part. I'm going to go down to verse 5. For there is one God, there's a truth that we need to stick on, right? There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed, this is Paul writing, for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. And I'm a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So what is that truth that Jesus was born to testify to? There's one God. There's one mediator between God and man. It is Jesus himself. He came to testify that that's what he was. And that he gave himself as a ransom for all people. That's really not too complicated, is it? One God, one mediator, who gave himself as a ransom for all the people. And we know that the truth costed Jesus his life. Many would not believe who he was. He claimed to be the Savior, the Son of God. 
the atoner, the mediator. Many did not believe who he was and what he did. They did not see his life being sacrificed as an atonement for sin. But Jesus, think about this. He could not say anything other than that. Why? Why could Jesus not say anything other than the fact that he was the mediator? There's only one God. And the mediator gave his life for all the people. The reason he couldn't say anything other than that is because that was the truth. He had to say that. I want you to look as an example at his interaction, at Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders of, the, of his day. It's a little bit scary. It's kind of harsh language, but uh, this is the Son of Man talking to those who shepherd and lead God's people. He's not talking to the ordinary people. He's talking to the pastors. He's talking to the leaders. John 8, 44 through 46. Why is my language not clear to you? This is Jesus speaking because you are unable to hear what I have to say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of of all lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Everyone who listens to me is on the side of truth. Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Strong words, aren't they? You're a religious leader. You're a pastor. You're spiritually guiding other people. And somebody confronts you with that. That's, that's strong. So there's a couple of things I want to mention there. God is the author of truth. Satan is the author of lies. That comes through very clear. The author of lies desires to suppress and eliminate the truth. In this case with Jesus, the author of lies intended to kill him. The, to one who has rejected the truth, he's unable to even hear the truth. And the native language of the devil is lying. The, na the native language of the Father is the truth. And I was thinking about Satan's approach it has never changed, has it? Go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I think you guys have been in Genesis for a while. The same way that Satan approached Adam and Eve, he cast doubt on God's Word. In Genesis 3, this is Satan talking to Eve. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And then later contradicting God's word by saying you will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from that tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So in a sense, Satan presented an alternate truth. Yeah, I know what God said. I, I know what God told you. But here's, here's the real deal here. You can, you can try that. And so another truth was presented, unfortunately for us. Adam and Eve made bad decisions. And ever since that time, there's been that same cosmic battle between the truth and a lie. And Satan's tactics have not changed. 
So just quickly in, in summary, the truth is critically important. It divides and separates people. It's directly tied to the gospel and access to God. And what do we do with all this now? What's the application? How do we apply this in our life? Well, you know, my first thought is I could be talking to someone here <clears throat> who's never embraced the truth, who's never come to a point in their life to where they said there is one God and one mediator. And I recognize that to be Jesus Christ. And I believe that he died for my sins and for the sins of the world. So if you never come to that point, I would encourage you to give some thought to that today. That's step one, right? And if you have, if you do come to that conclusion, please tell somebody. Tell Dick, tell one of these uh, deacons, tell, tell a friend here and start the, the life of discipleship and growing. So that would be step one. But what about most of us that are here today who have already believed there's one God and one mediator, and we've put our faith in Jesus, and we're um, believing and trusting in what he's done. We've already embraced the ultimate truth. How do you apply this truth to your life? Well, a couple of things came to mind. One thing is to remember that the Holy Spirit lives within you. I think we forget that too much, don't y'all? His function is to guide you into truth. You've got that compass, and it's telling you where true north is. Use it. We live in a nation and among a people that have forgotten about God and therefore about truth. They really, as I said earlier, in general, there's a total disregard for truth and really for God. I was reading in Romans 1, and it pains me to admit the degree to which this scripture des describes our broken culture, but listen to what Paul says in Romans uh, 1, 18 through 32. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And listen to this. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. And then verse 26 and 27 gives gory details about how that plays out in culture and it looks just like us. It really does. Hurts to even read it, so I'm not. So, in all of two, this uh, little review of 2020 we did, and we talked about the truth. What else can we do as believers? Well, one thing that I think God wants us to do is we can make a difference when we vote. Is there a darker, more sinful, more blind arena than our current political arena? Is there anything worse? God's the only hope for our country, but he doesn't snap his fingers most of the time in changed circumstances. How does God work most of the time? Through his people, the ones that have the compass inside of them, the ones that 
know the truth. How do lies how do the lies get challenged? I believe in the separation of church and state. But we have to be willing to proclaim the truth even when it angers others or causes separation. That is the impact of the truth. We have to hold our politicians accountable at the polls. And after the vote is complete, with our phone calls, with our letters, we in the church are the ones endowed with the truth. Who will make a difference if we do not? The answer to that is no one. Because no one else has the compass. No one's walking around with the Holy Spirit like we are. We got into this political mess because Christians in our country have abandoned the truth. So I encourage you today as application, speak the truth in love. Like we said, with gentleness, kindness, looking at others who are on the other side as captive. But we have to speak. In your home, talk about the truth with your children. Teach them the truth. Live out a life surrendered to the truth right in front of them. Control the environment in your house. I'm astounded today at what Christian parents allow their children to be exposed to at age nine, a phone, a computer with no restraints, no constraints. And if we, if we believe that this culture will not infiltrate their minds, we are just naive. We really are. The home is where the biggest difference can be made. I've been through that. I understand the, um, the challenges there. Um, I thought while I was putting this together, um, I have a college age daughter. She's getting ready to get married. She's really past college age now. She's 27, I think. And, uh, you know, we've had some pretty frank discussions about what's going on in this world and what my stance is. And, She's been what I think, what I would interpret as uh, disappointed in me a couple of times because I excluded, I, had, I, I honored the line that was drawn and I stuck to the truth. And of course, uh, that's what we're called to do as believers. We're, we're heralds of the truth. And the last thing that I want to happen is my children or my grandchildren to think of me when I'm gone one day and say, um, he gave in to the lie. We don't want that to happen, do we? So in your house, you can make a huge difference. In your conversations with unbelievers, you can be a part of their release. They're held captive. You can state the truth and help the captive be set free. How about when you're writing checks? Do you spend your money in, uh, on, uh, on, the, on kingdom stuff? Does, you, does your money spending reflect the life that's motivated by the knowledge of the truth? Are you tithing? Is it the first thing that comes out or the last? Are you investing in the kingdom? Are you, or are you wasting money on worldly pleasures? Are you hoarding wealth beyond what's needed for the future? I really believe we need more believers to model the truth by the way they handle their wealth. And the last one is kind of a surprise, and this is another way you can apply this truth. Encourage other believers. Because like I said, I don't think I've ever seen a time in history where believers have been more silenced, more suppressed. 
We need to encourage each other to speak the truth in love, but to do it. Ravi Zacharias just passed away. He's a noted Christian scholar and apologist, probably the, might be the sharpest mind I've ever read or heard speak. But he said this one time, and, and uh, I, I think it's true. I'll, I'll never forget it. He said, the most important question in life that a man can ask is the question that Pilate asked Jesus. What is truth? So, in light of the chaos of 2020, in light of the truth that we know about and the spirit that lives within us, we can take action. Our culture is quickly deteriorating before our eyes. And my prayer for you and for me is that God would stir us to be what we were created to be, heralds of the truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. It is a blessing to be exposed to your word. Um, it's a blessing to hear from you. I pray that each of us here would ponder these scriptures that we've reviewed today, that we would see them as they really are, the very words of God. And would we learn how to hang on every single word that you say? It is true, Father. We don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from your mouth. Thank you again for uh, this time that we can worship in freedom without fear of persecution. And we remember today those all around the world who can't do so. Would you bless them and would you give them endurance and strength. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.